Order of the Crimson Arm is a Fire Emblem 7 hack ROM by the Masked Raider. I had a great time playing this hack, and after finishing it up a few months ago, I wanted to revisit it with a fresh eye and talk about some of its standout maps. And the first map that came to mind when I was reviewing the 25 some odd maps is Chapter 13, Light of the Emperor. It takes place right in the midpoint of the game, just a few chapters into the game's second arc and before promotion starts to happen in mass. And in my discussions with others who have played the game, Chapter 13 is often cited as one of the game's best, if not its most notable. Even for those who haven't played it, they may be vaguely familiar with the chapter featuring the fat bishop and the beams of light. What is it about this map that makes it such a standout? Let's talk a little bit more about what this chapter does to create that ultimately memorable experience. And it's important to remember that sometimes making a memorable chapter isn't just about the chapter itself, but the buildup that goes into it, and then the execution in both narrative and gameplay to make it happen. So let's start a little bit with where we're at in this particular point in the story. Chapter 13 has the player, led by your Lord Algamus and your self-insert tactician, alongside their pals Ernst, the Myrmidon Jagan, and your third Lord Wayland, engaged in a conflict with Zentirum, the continent's holy land that has been waging war and causing trouble for a lot of folks throughout the course of the game's story. After backing Cortez, the king who we defeat, to bookend the first 11 chapters, the group turns their sights to Zentirum, who is sponsoring him and really enabling him to do some of the things that he was doing. So just as far as villain design goes, Zentirum as an enemy faction is a pretty cool one. We do first brush up against with them directly in an earlier chapter where we see monks with brigand AI, which is another standout feature of the hack, watching a monk go in and destroy a house. The Inquisition is certainly a force, and they're mentioned constantly throughout the game. They're a real presence, and while evil churches are certainly no stranger to the genre, I find that Fire Emblem, and especially ROM hacks, doesn't really have too many plots centered around them. You know, obviously Three Houses have the Church of Saros, but besides that, there's not really too, too many evil churches, especially in the ROM hacking scene. So they're a pretty distinct enemy faction, and again, it's not every day you're worried about enemy monks, of all things. So getting into the chapter itself, the group stumbles into a conflict with Lawrence, the beautiful Geb Splice, who looks like he is a melty fish, just like a melting flounder man. And he's a zealot with immense power, and for a one-off boss, he's super distinct. Not only just visually, but he's got some funny zingers, um, and his feverish devotion to his god is certainly notable. He has a conflict with Cynthia, which you saw on screen just a few moments ago, who is a wyvern lord you recruit later. And he's also just hyper-focused on destroying the heretics by blasting villages with these beams of light, which I'll show on screen in just a bit. It's a neat trick of eventing to show the flash of light and then a ruined village. It's super creative, and just a fun twist on typical Typical anti-turtles like bandits destroying a town or a chief, not a chief, a thief taking a chest. Um, even at the end of the map, Algamus and crew have this somber moment where they reflect on how powerful and scary it all was. And it certainly is. He's a zealous individual. This is a scary time in the story. And it's kind of that turning point where you realize, oh crap, like what are we, what are we up against? Um, are there more fat, melty fish bishops that we need to deal with? You know, at this point we don't know but we know what this guy's capable of. Now getting onto the map itself, it's a fairly large map with multiple paths and villages to save. Right off the bat, the player is alerted that Lawrence is essentially going to charge his heaven laser and every few turns he'll pass some judgment on the village. It's your turn, it's your job to go to each village and evacuate them ASAP. For a blind player, this is a pretty huge rush because you don't know who you will be targeting, and the villages across the map are predominantly in its corners and midpoints. Shoutouts to corners. Splitting is basically required if you want a real shot at getting all the rewards safely, 
and evacuating all of the villagers. Well, I'd argue that the anticipation can be a bit ruined on repeat playthroughs because you'll know the attack order. For a first run, it's certainly a rush and presents a fun anti-turtle and challenge. You really don't know when the tragedy will strike, but you have to keep moving to avoid it. In addition to this anti-turtle, a group of sages appears from your starting position after a number of turns to chase you down. While not quite instant game over units if they attack your group, they're strong enough that you don't want to deal with them regularly. You probably just want to wrap up the map once they show up. It's yet another incentive to move quickly and defeat Lawrence as soon as you can. So beyond the boss, there's a few other distinct new characters we get. There's the first chapter with a, chan a dancer, Kat Katarina, who is a welcome addition. But we also get our first interactions with Cynthia, who we've seen on screen a few times here, but also a few times leading into this chapter. For me, I think it's always important that characters get a proper introduction, and especially villains that turn against their side. It's really important to see how they come to that decision. It's important for building empathy and not making their decision feel arbitrary or contrived to fulfill a gameplay purpose. If we didn't see Cynthia in those earlier scenes with Cortez or with others from Zentirum showing doubt or not really believing in what her country was doing, the scene would feel out of place and Cynthia's one woman fight here would feel a bit forced. In context of the whole narrative, it feels pretty natural and it also provides another objective going over to talk to her so she can get the heck out of there. She won't be recruited until much later. It's part of the ongoing saga with these kinds of units. In addition to our dancer and Cynthia, we also get Aris, who's a recruitable shaman you get standing at one of the villages. She's another fan favorite, and as your second dark magic user after the tactician, and likely much better built for combat, she certainly is a bit of a standout. And while I had Aris die in my run a few chapters after recruiting her, others I've spoken to have sung her praises, said she's great, and in my opinion her design, this emo girl with a scar, is pretty distinct as far as shaman go, and I can understand, especially in the context of Vanilla where there aren't so many great combat shaman, that having one here is pretty fun. So when it comes to things I would change about this map, the biggest thing for me is the choke points. There's a lot of one tile choke points here, and it can really slow down the flow of the map. Having to rush and get stuck in this conga line traffic jam can be a bit rough. On one hand, I could argue that having these choke points add to the intensity and force the player to use their best units and weapons to quickly clear that path to get to the village. I think that more than likely it's just going to add to frustration and feel more like a log jam than a challenge. I think widening some of these chokes would do a great deal for improving the overall map flow. Um, beyond that, the map is a little big. I think given the nature of the anti-turtle, I think it's okay because it's really like a timed rush to the, to the villages and so I'm willing to give it a pass, but it is probably a little bigger than I would personally design for. And you could probably make better use of some of the space, like this mountain at the bottom here is kind of needlessly big. Can we widen this out a little bit? Can we make another lower path or whatever? Um, there's some things we could do here to just improve the overall flow of the map. On a more narrative sense, one thing that I'm not crazy about here is that Lawrence is super powerful. I mean, the guy's able to nuke villages with beams of light. And beyond, you know, the somber moment at the end where they're all kind of in awe of what just happened, it's never mentioned again. And none of the other Zentirum forces do anything quite as awe-inspiring or just, you know, in the traditional sense, awesome, right? There's not a whole lot of, um, village nuking that happens later and never really comes up again. Really not until you fight one of the game's final bosses do you kind of see just such immense power and it feels kind of random that it's just in this midpoint chapter with a one-off boss. So for something so strong I'm surprised it doesn't have more narrative weight thereafter but I'm willing to give it a pass because for gameplay purposes it works out really well. So all in all this map has a lot going on, man. 
And between its distinct visual identity with the towns and the water, the beams of light, the turning point narratively in the conflict for Cynthia, a funny fat boss, <laughs> there's a lot to like here. And certainly, it's a lot different from your typical Fire Emblem fare. While it isn't super out there in the context of this game, it's a great map in both narrative and gameplay. And all in all, these elements come together to make that memorable experience. You have to remember that everyone plays Fire Emblem for a different reason. And when you're designing your hack, yes, you may say like this is a gameplay oriented hack or this is meant to emulate a specific game. Uh, people are going to take away different things from it. Some people are going to look at this map and be like, oh yeah, it's the one with the fat bishop. Others are going to be like, oh yeah, it's the one with that really cool beam of light mechanic. Or, two, or maybe people like me are going to say, oh, it's the map that has a pretty good anti-turtle. Um, and you get these characters who I liked using. So people will like your hack for different reasons. And having these different elements come together to create a package that can satisfy all these types of players is hard to do. And I want to applaud the Masquerader for making such a fun and memorable chapter. And it's certainly one that I look forward to revisiting next time I do play Order of the Crimson Arm. Before we go though, um, we'll skip RS's recruitment here. I'm just going to fast forward a little bit through the map to show one last thing here. Because I think I have it on this video. Here we go. Yeah, I think you should just see it happen. Here's the event. Did the light of the heavens cleanse the land of darkness? In his name and his glory, judgment was given. Yeah, so you see here, this is a really cool trick of eventing to just completely obliterate the village. By the twelve, indeed, Algamus. Yeah. So, cool stuff. Very dark, very grim, um, but also good for gameplay. So, nice job. And so I ask you, in closing, Hackrom designers, to, and this is something I need to do as well, is think about how we can create better and different types of anti-turtles. And I think it's important not only to think from the lens of the how, like what do I do, but what's the end goal, right? If we're trying to find a thematic replacement for a brigand destroying a town, think about the end of that. The point is to get the player to move quickly to save the village. In this scenario too, the beams of light serve that same end, but through a very different means. And so I would certainly encourage you all to think about that and how we can be more creative. Thanks for watching.